Enrique, it's fantastic for you to be here today. Uh, thank you for joining us. So our guest today is Enrique Aragao, who is the VP and General Manager at G2. Enrique started his career as a product manager um, after founding his own company and then went on to spend four years uh, developing a consultancy business that was eventually acquired by Accenture. Um, post that, he spent three and a half years with Steelbricks in the configure price quote application business that was built on top of Salesforce, which I believe eventually was then acquired by Salesforce. So you've been through this multiple journey of building um, organizations and sales teams in Europe, and now you've had the privilege of joining G2 as the VP and GM to launch this business into the UK and Europe. G2 is disrupting the B2B technology um, buying space by connecting buyers to vendors based on authentic customer reviews and real-time ratings of business software and related services. Um, you've absolutely become the leading B2B review platform and recently surpassed over a million reviews. Um, it's been fantastic to see the volume of buyers that come to G2 every single month. Now you're expanding globally. You've offered open office here in London this year, um, and you're looking to develop relationships with the buyer and sales community to help accelerate growth. Now, notably, you've had over $100 million of investment from the likes of IVP, Excel Partners, um, and the like. So we're super excited, Enrique, for you to be our guest today. Um, as you know, we really care about the sales leaders building these machines, um, and you've had a phenomenal journey. So as we go through this conversation, it'd be good to understand and learn some of that experience that you've been through. Um, but as you're here today, um, What's got you excited about today? Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's, uh, you know, I've been accompanying the journey that Sales Confidence has been on for the last two years. Yeah. Um, I think I must have been to the very first um, Sales Confidence event in London. And, and I should be, well, it's the 28th of November. I'd like to say thank you. I'm very <laughs> grateful um, for, um, for you, James, to have started this up. I think that a lot of my professional journey in the last two years has been peppered with learnings and shared experiences with people that I've met thanks to what you've started. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to give back to that community. Um, what brought me here today? I, um, well, first of all, I was invited. Well, <laughs> um, glad you were right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but ultimately, you know, I, I did think a lot about um, what is it about what I do or what I've been through in, in, in my personal journey that could be useful to other people. Yeah. It's not the kind of thing that you think about every day. Sure. Um, in the end of the day, I was saying this to, I think, Lauren, when I was, when I was coming in, you know, at, at the end of the day, I'm just a person doing a job, um, but do something that I love that speaks to me. And, um, you know, if this is going to be useful for other people who are looking to find some purpose uh, or maybe just some tips in terms of how to grow their teams and their businesses, then I'm very happy to share that. Well, you know, I, I think one of your appeals is the level of humility that you carry yourself with. But do not underestimate um, the success that you've had in your career and how others look to that for aspiration and inspiration. And so part of the conversation today is how we can understand a bit about you that's made you successful um, and can inspire the next generation of sales leaders. Um, so when you think about, um, you know, you wake up in, in the morning, what's the first thing that you tend to think about when you first wake up? Um, so probably like... Five years ago, the first thing I would think about in the morning is everything that I need to get done in the day. Um, I think over the last five years, I've started to become a lot more um, conscious of why it is that I do what I do or, or get up in the morning in the first place. Um, so I, I've, I've learned to put things into perspective, especially if you work in uh, you know a, a stressful environment. We all know how stressful a sales environment can be yeah. um i tend to always wake up looking for something to be grateful about and usually it's something involving my family or or, or something to do with my personal life mm -hmm. uh, so i always look for something like that in the morning um so i tend to focus on that first um and then 
and then I look at my, my diary for the day. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. So there's a level of kind of um, gratitude. Gratitude and perspective. Yeah. yeah. And that's helpful because it's intense, these environments, and it's easy to get locked in to think straight about the day ahead yeah. and the business is required to do. So the fact that you have a moment of pause um, to reflect is, is helpful to hear. If you think about um, how you've developed your career and you've kind of up-leveled fairly rapidly, mm -hmm. um, particularly through some of these uh, acquisitions that you've been part of, where, where have you found the motivation and inspiration to develop your career? Um, look, I... I never, everyone has got goals, right? And everyone sets, everyone, anyone who's ambitious and wants to achieve um, some level of fulfillment in life will set themselves goals. And I've certainly done that. Um, I think what we what we appreciate over time is that having goals helps you move forward. Mm -hmm. um, but having goals also makes you realize that whatever you set yourself as a goal is not really what ends up happening. Uh -huh. um, if I reflect on my career, you're correct. Um, I'm probably, I'd say, 25 to 30% along my journey that I, I hope to, to be on. Mm -hmm. And that's both due to the fact that there's still a lot of stuff I want to do um, and also due to the fact that I, I think I'm still relatively young to be doing what I'm doing. Um, I So first of all, I never thought I wanted to be in sales. I think you probably hear that a lot. Um, I was probably very... Um, dismissive of sales as a profession uh, and I think that's probably been the case because of my background and where I studied and where I was brought up and eventually also I think Europe has nowhere near the level of maturity in terms of recognizing sales as a profession Absolutely. and as a discipline as you do in the US um, so the acceleration of my career really was that I got into sales purely because I wanted to have a bigger impact in businesses and I, I, I realized that that was the case. Um, I, you know, I, I was the first salesperson in a relatively small startup that was riding a very massive wave, which was the, the CRM space um, about 10 years ago. And we were very successful. Um, I became very successful in my individual contributor role as a result of that. And yes, that accelerated my career. That got me into leadership very early, much earlier than um, I would normally recommend um, for anyone. Um, and in hindsight, I probably would have benefited from waiting a bit longer. Um, but I think that if you find the right wave um, to ride and you are surrounded by people that believe in you and support you, um, I think that, you know, you don't have to get lucky to, to, to sort of, to accelerate your career. I mean, I, I remember when I wanted to get into sales, um, the people that I was working with, the people I was working with, they basically didn't give me that shot. I said, no, not, probably not right now. Then I found some, another group of people who had a different business who said, actually, yeah, we'll give you a shot. So you kind of need that break. You need somebody to like, kind of believe in you. Yeah. Um, so I got a good break and, and that allowed me to sort of get going. Do you recall your first interaction with a sales professional or a sales experience? While you weren't seeking sales originally, what, and you talk about that trigger, was there something or somebody or some reference that you had that you thought, actually, that, that could work for me, that could be an interesting career route? Um, I don't know if you've heard this story before, but um, right, so um, I'm originally from Brazil. Uh, I'm an economic migrant. Right. I moved away from Brazil um, because I wanted a better life for myself and for my family at some point. And um, if anyone's familiar with geopolitics or economics, they will know that um, Brazil, despite being a massive economy and a massive opportunity for the individual person who's moving up the ranks and looking for a career and a job, there's very few things that you can do if you're based in Brazil. So um, I did that through education. Okay. Right. So. Um, went out, got myself a lot of very fancy degrees, um, spent a lot of money, raised a lot of money, um, both from my family and, and through my own doing, to be able to afford the opportunity to go and study at some pretty big schools abroad and eventually become an economic migrant. And, um, you know, you don't really go to university and take a sales degree oh. as a route to um, emigrate, right? You go to... Uh, law school, you go, you study medicine, right? Or you go to business school, 
right? I did, I went to business school, right? Um, and my first interaction with sales where I went, mm, it's actually a career and mm, um, there's actually a lot of potential there was through um, uh, my first job when I was in the UK um, and I was a product manager um, thinking that, you know, I've got all this knowledge around business, around how to, you know, go to market with a new product and understand how to put a new product and an offering together. And I'm going to go along with these salespeople to go and sort of introduce it into the market. And one of those salespeople um, was somebody who had never been to um, uh, university, didn't have any higher degrees, uh, any higher education degrees, um, and was making about five times as much money as I was. Um, not only was that person doing incredibly well, they were highly inspiring as well. Um, and um, we ended up um, dating, she's actually my wife nowadays, but I, I, credit, I credit my interest in sales as a profession and um, in terms of um, respecting it uh, as something that should be studied and should be learned rather than something that you're born with uh, to Laura. Um, and um, rest is history, I guess. Oh, amazing. I'm not, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to match a background story um, like that. And uh, we look forward to having Laura on the podcast at some point. Um, if you think of that early part of your career, clearly there were some habitual behaviours or ways that you applied yourself that allowed you to progress perhaps quicker than some of your peers. Can you recall some of the activities or actions or approaches that you took as an individual contributor that you feel gave you the best um, platform to develop and be successful? Yeah. I, mean, I, th I, I, <clears throat> I think about that often because obviously I've been trying to build teams and sort of figure out what are the buttons that you can help people press to yeah. help them develop and make an impact. Um, I think one of the biggest misconceptions about what it takes to be successful in sales is that you need to be uh, an extrovert, great with people, um, you know, social butterfly, all that kind of stuff. Um, I do believe in the power of emotional intelligence and self-awareness. Um, I think there are things that we go through in life that help prepare us for the inevitable um, reliance that salespeople need to have on resilience. And I think rejection is, is one such thing. People go through all sorts of different types of rejection. Um, there's certainly been certain episodes of rejection in my life that I think have helped me when I got into sales. Just pick yourself up and keep going. Um, I don't see myself as a, a, a hugely extroverted person, but equally, I think that having the ability to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations and not be easily judgmental on oneself around how you feel or, how, or what people think of you is really, really important. I think that's a skill that you develop over time. Mm -hmm. Some people are born with it, but I think it can be developed. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been quite technically orientated. So working in sales and technology, that's been super helpful. So as I said, I started off in product management. I did go into sales engineering as well. So I'd be like building demos, uh, customizing products and actually um, building, crafting sales pitches and sales solutions off the back of my deep technical understanding of a solution. And look, I'd love to be able to code. I don't know how to code. I don't know how to build products. But I, I, I do have an interest in understanding how things work. Yeah. Um, and thankfully, the technologies that I've worked in are technologies that you don't need to be uh, a coder or, or you know have a computer science degree to understand. And I think that um, especially in technology sales, um, I think actually with any kind of selling, if you know your stuff, and if you know what you're selling and you can hold your ground and you don't need to rely on other people to actually add value. Um, and I know we're gonna talk about the future of sales. Um, people want expertise, right? And you need to be an expert either in what you're selling or in the space that you're selling in or in the business of your customers. And I think that if people can learn to sort of channel a curiosity around either one of those areas, they can really help advance their careers. And I think that that's really helped me. So you talk there, I mean, what you're kind of alluding to is kind of this innate curiosity to understand the technology that you're working with, understand your buyer, become an expert. You've been through already in the time since you landed at G2 to the number of heads that you've hired. 
what have been those attributes there for that you have, you can look at your team now and you say, that's, that's what my team represents. That's what I looked for. That's what I've got. Or in fact, actually, I've discovered these other traits that are having a positive impact on your growth rates. Right, right. Yeah. I, I, I think a lot about you know, how to find best people that are going to be aligned to what you want to achieve as a team and as a business. Um, and I've looked at all sorts of different models, you know, um, you could, you could hire for attributes, you can hire for skills. Um, I believe in, uh, hiring for strengths rather than lack of weakness. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that if, when you look at somebody and you think about all the reasons to discount them and why they wouldn't be successful, uh, you end up hiring people that are going to be a lot less successful than when you hire someone because you focus on their strengths. Um, very cognizant of that. Um, there are, I, I find, I, I found myself hiring more and more for the intangible. Uh, and that sounds super, um, um, that sounds super dangerous. And I guess it could be, but I'm very clear on what my intangibles are. Um, so I do look for people that are vulnerable, like openly vulnerable and that are not afraid to speak truths. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, I get I get told that a lot, but because I'm Latin, I tend to sometimes have no filter. Um, I think that's so important when working in the kind of space that we work in today. So I look for vulnerability, I look for truth. Um, you mentioned curiosity. I think there's, yeah, there's, there's this whole aspect of like appetite to learn. What are those people doing? I think I mentioned how I appreciate going to the events that you guys put together. And I see sometimes, you know, people that are clearly early, early on in their career and they're there and they're taking notes. Like that's the kind of stuff that I look for. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I love people that have a story, you know, um, people are not just looking for a job, um, but people that have a story that they've crafted, um, and that they understand where this opportunity of us working together fits in that story. Yeah. Right. This is not the end destination. It's another step. Um, so I think it's really important to look for people that have that feeling of, you know, I've got a story. I'm on a journey. I'm on a path um, rather than really focusing just on the job. You know? oh, I like that. Um, thinking a little bit more and helping kind of the audience understand a bit more about G2, right, as a company. And I've had the um, uh, privilege to experience the kind of um, HQ, the, the epicenter of G2 based out of uh, the Chicago head office. From your experience, thinking about what attracted you to G2, what was the fundamental DNA of G2 that you really appreciate and that you feel part of something special? Mm-hmm. Um, every company talks about their values, right? Um, I think it's really interesting because I, I feel so in tune with the values that we have at G2, which represent what I admire in the leadership team and you know my leaders at G2. Um, at the same time, I find it really interesting that we are so different, right? I mean, you know my CRO, you know my CEO, and I'm sure you can probably tell me that, you know, when speaking to me and speaking to them, like we're very completely different people, right? Um, but at G2, our values um, are represented by the acronym PEAK, uh, which stands for performance, entrepreneurship, um, authenticity, and kindness, right? And, um, and the whole, the whole um, thought behind PEAK is that actually it's inspired by, by, on, on a book by a guy called Chip Conley, um, who had a very successful boutique hotel company and eventually became head of growth at Airbnb. Um, but his whole philosophy about um, life and about work and building companies is um, mirrored on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm-hmm. So our entire value structure at, at G2 is based on these peak values. Uh, and we have built a hierarchy of needs that we identify with. Um, and if I had to sum it up in terms of an essence, um, I would say that what we are is that we are a, we're a family of entrepreneurs that transcends businesses, right? So at G2, we have people that have worked together in over five different companies over 20 years. And what keeps bringing us back together is that we all have um, an innate uh, desire to build and to grow businesses um, and to um, derive happiness from from building relationships with other people that will surpass and transcend those businesses. So some of us um, still have the ambition one day of setting up their own businesses. 
I'm one of those people. Some people have a passion um, and a fire around just building companies. Um, and others um, have perhaps done it before, but need to be within an environment where they've got support um, from others that can help them along the way. But I, I think that I think that kind of summarizes kind of the essence of the business and why you know I I, I love the teams and, and the people that I work with. And I think just hearing you speak and thinking about um, you know I've got to know many different people at G two. But when you talk about those those intangibles, but you can feel it, you know, even when you're describing that experience, the, you're absolutely right. When you think of the founding team, how many businesses they've been involved in building together, the type of people that have been close early on and keep coming back, yeah. like, you know, they create that experience in that environment. They demonstrate that they care, that kindness definitely comes across, but they still want to innovate and they yeah. still want to lead. And they still want to be category um, world leaders. And I think that whole mix is just making it a super um, attractive um, place to work. But I think it's also clearly having a fundamental positive impact on the growth that you're achieving. Um, what is G2 for the layman? What, what actually is G2? What's the platform? What's the product? What does it, what does it do? That's a very good question. I think... I think we are we're effectively a business to business um, software review website yeah. in the strictest of terms right and we help both buyers who are incredibly confused about the amount of technology that's available out there for their businesses make really um, well informed uh, decisions about what works best for them and ultimately reach their fullest potential as individuals. Mm -hmm. And also we're helping companies um, really reach their growth potential by helping them put um, their best image forward um, in the eyes of their customers, right? And um, effectively today, we're helping both buyers and uh, sellers. Um, but ultimately what we're doing is we're really capturing um, the fact that uh, B2B buying is becoming a lot more like B2C buying. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's having significant impacts in the way in which not just um, we engage with technology, but also the ways in which we build businesses, right? The way we market what we do and how we can help people. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, I think right in the, we're in the midst of a significant transformation and G2 is at the center of that. Uh, yes, we're disrupting the um, uh, software analyst model uh, yes, we're disrupting the way in which um, we market um, software uh, to buyers. But ultimately, I think the, the end goal of G2 is to be um, the number one marketplace um, for you to buy and to sell software in, into businesses. Amazing. How have you seen um, G2 develop from a UK and European perspective? If you think of your responsibilities now... Um, to develop G2's business growth in the UK and Europe. Um, what do you project is going to play out over the coming years? Um, well, it's interesting because there's, we, whoever's worked in tech has invariably worked with or for um, American headquartered companies. Um, I've certainly done that quite a few times. Um, so we do, we do a lot of um, data analysis, right? So we, we survey software buyers, we look at the data, right? So if you look at G2 today, um, as a marketplace, um, there's about 60 million people a year coming to G2, right? Um, and six, these 60 million people are coming to G2 because um, people, are, people are, as I said, confused about technology. They are looking for information that can help them make decisions about what works for them and what doesn't. Um, so I think that the, the market for software is global. Um, I don't like to think of like Europe and US from the perspective of the market. You know, companies that are setting up today, software companies that are being set up, you know, you co companies are being born global, right? Um, just because you're headquartered in the US doesn't mean that there's not going to be a startup in Slovenia that's going to sp spring up within the next six months and, and, and eat your lunch, right? Uh, and certainly I felt that um, going round to different regions of 
the the EMEA region, which is what we cover at the moment uh, here out of London. Uh, I certainly felt that. I think there's still a little bit of um, catching up in some areas, specifically when there is like some really niche software software spaces. Uh, but when you think about the bigger software categories, and we look at sales tech, martech. Um, travel management, uh, HR, um, ERP, um, those are global software markets. So I don't like to think of sort of the two markets as being very different. Now, when you look at um, the seller side, when people that people that are actually selling and, and marketing, uh, I do think that there's still um, a, a disconnect. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that um, the US um, market has been quicker to wake up to adopting more b2c approaches in the world of b2b when it comes to marketing and sales yeah. i think that a lot of teams in europe are still catching up but there are some incredibly smart people with a lot of experience that are really shaking things up and the companies that are doing that really well um, are likely to sort of really really take off in the next few years amazing amazing exciting um just bring it back again now to kind of um the focus of our audience around sales. Right. Um, is, is there kind of, is there a book um, that you feel has had impact on your sales career um, that you've learned from? Um, it's probably a lot of books to name. Um, I'm quite a prolific reader. Um, I enjoy sort of reading about the profession. Um, I think um, there's there is one book that I I'd say had an impact on me, um, and that's a book that was recommended to me by my CEO um, at our services company Tequila, which um, was acquired by Accenture. Um, his name's Mark Wakelin. Um, he helped me really understand how to break down a sales process, and one of the books that he recommended, um, and if you've probably heard of it. Um, it's called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play um, by Mahan Khalsa. And this book formed, it, it, it was widely used in the space where people were selling in services, professional services. And I think that's one of the toughest, toughest sales environment, like selling services, because you're not selling features and functions. And if you are, you're selling a very customized version of it. So it really brings you back to like selling on business needs, mm -hmm. right? And really selling painkillers rather than vitamins, which is an analogy I always like to draw to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, vitamins are great and makes you feel good, so you should take it, right? Um, but painkillers probably, you're gonna move quicker on getting some of those into you, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this book is really great because um, it really breaks down the sales process in terms of how to focus on selling value in a structured way. Uh, and actually, funnily enough, and this was before we were acquired by Accenture, um, when I did join Accenture via the acquisition, uh, I went to one of the best sales trainings I ever went to, uh, and they actually used the contents of this book to structure their entire um, sales process uh, in terms of the, 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 the curriculum. Um, so I really recommend that. Um, but somebody selling, somebody new to B2B selling software, like there's another book that I think that's it's like really practical, uh, especially if somebody comes to me and says, okay, what can I read that's like gonna teach me 80% of what I need to do to, need to know to do my job um, and this one you might know is called New Cells Simplified by Mike Weinberg mm -hmm. um, so it just teaches you the basics and keeps you from making stupid decisions yeah. as, as you go through the cycle yeah. Yeah. I mean so it's and it's good that ultimately what we're doing has been done before many many times people right. have refined those experiences refined those processes um, you know while um, it's always better to have that lived experience to be able to reference those type of guides that's helpful and it's good to hear um, that, that you're well read um, thinking about you know the even this year the number of events that we've organized right for the sales professional and the sales leader what what kind of attracts you and where do you notice or what do you see in those that stand out as the best in your eyes? You know, what, what are the best salespeople or sales leaders doing? Hmm. Um, I think we underestimate um, we underestimate the importance of going the extra mile, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think the average salesperson that salesperson who's struggling to make quota, and we know that that's the average, right? The average salesperson makes like 60% of quota. Um, they don't really go the extra mile, right? They, I mean, salespeople tend to like hate 
putting themselves out there to actually get a no, right? So pe- people are scared of rejection, yeah. right? I think the best salespeople always go the extra mile. And um, you know, when you're in the extra mile, it's not very crowded, right? And, and, it's, and it's in that space where you know, you're alone and, and then I think that really great things happen. Um, and I've experienced that from the buying side, like somebody goes the extra mile, or even in recruitment, you know, there's okay. something to be said about that, right? Yeah. And I think the best salespeople always go the extra mile, mm-hmm. right? And there's, there's, there's a fine line between not taking no for an answer and being stubborn, but I think that's one thing that I see a lot of. Um, the other one is that um, I find that the best salespeople, they pay in advance. They, they give more than they take. And... Um, I think that's something that I've always tried to sort of be cognizant of both in terms of how I approach projects and what I look for in people and what I see in people that do really well. And you're a fantastic example of that, which is giving as much value as you possibly can without expecting anything in return. Mm -hmm. Um, And when you do that consistently from the heart, um, great things happen, right? And sales success doesn't happen in six months. Yes, you can sell a lot in six months. You can have a fantastic first year in sales. The truly great salespeople and the truly fulfilled, successful people that carry um, themselves well year after year, sometimes decade after decade, are the kind of people that consistently give more than they're taking and do things because they want to advance the greater good and great things result from it. Um, and there's very few people that do that really well and do that consistently. I think you're one of those people, James. And well, that's kind. Thank yeah. you, Michelle. Um, but that's what I see in great salespeople as well. Yeah, and, it's, and it is that, um, it's that consistency over time and then being able to sustain it. It's that builds trust, um, right? Absolutely. Trust is all about consistency. And when people trust you, people follow you, Yeah. right? And, and your reputation follows along with you yeah absolutely so then <clears throat> thinking about the future then of this profession thinking about you know where is it going you think about the impact technology is having now uh, on the buying experience you think about um, the number of sales technology tools that sales professionals have access to what's your view on where the future of sales is going I think sales is going to undergo a transformation over the next five years, the likes of which we've seen in marketing um, the previous five years, right? Um, I speak a lot about this with people um, that are in similar roles or building businesses. Um, So like six, seven years ago, we saw massive consolidation in the marketing tech space, right? A lot of acquisitions. So, you know, uh, Oracle, Adobe, Salesforce, Microsoft, IBM, everyone consolidated the marketing tech stack. Um, I think the same is happening around sales, primarily driven by transformations in the profession of selling. Um, We've been talking about the consumerization of IT for God knows how long, right? B2B software needs to be as easy to use as B2C software, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that a lot of people are starting to get caught out by the fact that consumerization of buying in B2B is real, it's happening, and it's going to upend um, sales tech, the sales profession, and the way that we build businesses. Um, so for the salesperson, you know, you need to ask yourself, why am I doing things the way I've always been doing them, right? The reality is, in this new world of consumerized buying, Um, the least trusted teams in a business that a buyer can engage with are sales and marketing, right? They don't trust you. So don't bring a water pistol to a gunfight because it's not going to end up well, right? And by water pistol, I'm talking about your snazzy sales deck, your polished demo, your case studies and your white papers, right? Your let me me run a discovery and and pepper you with 20,000 questions approach. Um, I think that that's the kind of transformation that needs to, um, that we need to make sense of. And I think a lot of the sales tech that we're seeing coming um, to the foreground now is um, capturing these transitions. Um, I think we need to stop selling and start helping people buy more. Um, 
the buyer is genuinely in control. Um, if we were going to buy a car 20 years ago, you'd walk into a dealership and you would sit down and talk about your needs and you'd then receive information about the different types of cars available. That doesn't happen anymore. And the world of B2B selling is pretty much going down the same route, mm. right? So um, simply working hard and getting more demos in and just trying to get that ROI um, exercise done is not going to do it anymore, right? You need to really understand your buyer. You need to leverage technology to understand where is the buyer in their buying cycle and stop thinking about your sales process and start thinking about the buyer's journey mm -hmm. and meet them where they are at in their buyer journey and the channels that they are at, right? You don't attract buyers anymore, you go to them. Yeah. And I think, and I think the, the inbound is really important, but I also think that from a sales profession, I think that uh, inbound will become more and more um, um, Less, I think that the quality of inbound will become less and less um, relevant. Um, we we'll still have inbound. People will still sort of come to you, but the quality of inbound will be less and less. So understanding the buyers and the technology that is there today to allow you to do that is going to is going to really empower you to actually have a gun rather than a water pistol um, and really hit the bullseye. No, that's, that's interesting. Um, as you know, when we think about um, kind of our philosophy at Sales Confidence, and we, we think about the importance of um, your own inner confidence. You know, you talk about speaking your truth. Um, you speak towards um, having your own self belief and self awareness. Where do you think your own confidence has come from? My own confidence. Um, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know what confidence is, right? Um, I think I think having a level of imposter syndrome is healthy. I think feeling like you haven't got it quite figured out is very healthy. And understanding that that's natural um, is healthy. Um, I don't think you should ever try and shake that off. Um, I think... I think if you channel that kind of, I think it's okay to have lack of confidence, but if you channel that into humility and into self-awareness, it will be your strongest asset. That's kind of like how I, I look at that. I think people lose confidence when they fail at something. Um, and maybe they reflect the thinking that it means that they're, they're never going to succeed. Right. And the reality is I think we're not really impacted by failure itself, but the stories we tell ourselves about what does that failure mean? Mm. Right. Um, so I really do seek to be quite mindful and critical about what stories am I telling myself about what's going on? Because at the end of the day, you're not reacting to events, you're reacting to your judgments of those events. Mm. And that's kind of how I try to sort of, that's kind of how I tried to sort of guide myself, you know, well, that, yeah, but that's, a, you know, that's, a, that's a kind of a, a hyper sense of self and the awareness that you've developed, you know, may, maybe it's naturally and you're, you're aware of that. Um, but actually, this is what people often find a challenge is, um, you know, often a kind of a lack of confidence also comes from a misalignment of expectations. You expect one thing, the outcome is very different. And then when you add in the kind of imposter syndrome of not feeling good enough, that can create those additional challenges. So I think, you know, what you're demonstrating and also what you're sharing is that you're very thoughtful and reflective. And you're very curious at asking others questions, but also yourself. And that level of understanding, therefore, allows you to have humility. And where you have clear competencies, you've got confidence. You've got confidence in knowing what you do. And then you also have self-awareness on knowing what you're not so great at. And that's a community. And I think the traditional view on the sales professional um, is where kind of BS is involved because the gap between the reality and what they think they are is, is, is a gap. And that's then, I think, which loses trust. And so that combination and that self-awareness, why you may not... Um, kind of label it yourself as as confidence. Um, for me, it's that that thoughtfulness that you have that is allowing you to unlock your confidence in some of these areas. While it might might not be so evident to maybe more the extroverted character like myself that seems much more comfortable, you know, putting yourself out there on stage, etc. Um, I, I still believe that that kind of it, it, it kind of encapsulates confidence. Um, just to add, mm -hmm. um, you've you've clearly you know you've clearly picked some winners. 
right? And that is a that is an important aspect of building a successful sales career. Can you recall though some times when it was really difficult for you, or you really struggled and had some hardships in your career um, that you really had to dig deep to overcome them? Yeah, how many do you want? Just one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save um, the others for next year. It's funny, right? Like the the mind is a beautiful thing, right? Because um, although people can recall really big traumas that have had a big impact in their lives, um, the mind does tend to put some stuff on the shelf that it would rather not remember, right? Maybe you learn something at that point in time, then you move on. So, um, look, there have been times... Yeah, so... Um, when we sold our services company, I was, I felt at the time, at the top of my game. Um, I had um, made an incredible amount of money for a person of my age, had managed to build an amazing lifestyle off the back of it. Um, I'm, you know, I, I, I got given an opportunity to build my own team um, I think I was 24 at the time. Um, and, you know, my confidence was sky high. Um, not only that, I think like about a year and a half before I sold my first million dollar deal, um, which for me was something I, it was one of my life goals at the time in terms of like, I want to be able to do this, to feel like I've, I've got this sales thing nailed, uh, especially in services, like get somebody to sign off a million pounds worth of services. It was quite an achievement for me at the time. That's amazing. Um, and then we went into this um, environment, this company, which was a 300,000 person company, bearing in mind our little company was like 200 people. Um, we went to this 300,000 person company um, where, you know, like a lot of people didn't even get out of bed for a million pounds, right? Um, I mean, nobody cared about that and nobody cared about um, the fact that, you know, you really took sales as a profession seriously, right? Uh, I had about a year and a half of really struggling with the fact that I was in a really well-paid job. Um, I could afford to stay in bed or not go into the office any day of the week that I wanted and nobody would notice. Uh, and, and if I didn't, I went to the office, probably didn't make much of a difference either. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I had a really hard time figuring out, you know, why is it that I get out of bed in the morning? Um, and I was a really um, awful person for, you know, for a, a, quite a, a long amount of time, um, despite the fact that I had a really well paid job um, and I had a very little stress. So I really put things into perspective for me and kind of helped me understand why some people are wired in a particular way and other people are not. And I kind of figured out who I was off the back of that. Um, uh, and I, I think that was, yeah, that was a, that was a pretty low, low for me when, you know, you realize that you're, you're so fortunate to have had a lot of opportunity to, to do well and then kind of feel like crap about um, getting up in the morning and sort of um, feeling like what you do is actually gonna make any difference. Um, so that was about a year and a half of really trying to figure out what I wanted to do moving, moving forward. Interesting. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, I, in preparation for this, and you know, we've got to know each other um, particularly well in recent times, you know, when I kind of mention your name, often the word like machine comes about. Like you seem to have a relentless um, pace about how you apply yourself in your kind of work career. Um, I just wonder, how do you manage kind of like your own health and well-being, though, so you can sustain this kind of relentless pace um, in terms of how you approach building this business? That's a first for me. I don't consider myself a machine. Um, I, um, I do take my well-being very seriously. Um, there's two things that I always prioritize um, in terms of my well-being, and that is uh, sleep and exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and I always make sure I either do strenuous exercise or get eight hours sleep. Ideally both, um, but at least one of those every day. Um, and I think that it's just, if you, if you know that you are taking care of yourself and that you are prioritizing those things, then everything else falls into place. Mm -hmm. And there's no such thing as like, you know, cutting off work from personal time. If you really feel like what you're doing has a purpose, 
then you don't feel like work is taking over anything else, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I think it's really important to take care of yourself. So um, I do stress that and I, I make time for that. Um, so I would be coming to this meeting late if I felt like I needed eight hours sleep or if I felt that I hadn't exercised. Mm -hmm. and that's really important to me. Great. So I like that prioritization. Well, this has been fascinating to hear um, the, the story behind your background and how you've developed this career and this trajectory you're on. Is, is there a final thought or a final idea that you'd like to share um, with uh, our listeners? Well, it's just an interesting time of the year, right? It's like... Uh, November now, going into December. Um, I really enjoyed um, how you inspired everyone at one of the recent meetups, um, challenging people to really think about what do they want for themselves going into next year. I think that it's very healthy to, um, to take these moments to sort of think about that. So, you know, I certainly do this from time to time. So if I can leave people with something to think about today, it's to just... Ask yourself, you know, what are you getting out of um, your current job or what are you doing, you know, at the moment? Um, and who do you really aspire to be? And are you on the path to, um, to becoming that person? And if you're not, um, and if you're not enjoying what you're doing at the moment uh, on your journey to that aspiration, then maybe now's the time to, to reflect. Fantastic. Enrique, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on board and on the podcast. Um, thank you also for all the support um, G2 has given Sales Confidence. We're really excited um, developing the partnership and doing more in 2020. And um, if you want to learn more at G2, you can go to www.g2.com and likewise check out Sales Confidence uh, on the web. Enrique, you're a star, mate. Thanks, James. Well